Hi there, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Wonderful. All right, I'm sorry to be the barrier between you and your coffee break. I'll try to make this as interesting as possible. So my name is Tamanna. Um, I go by Tam in the world of uh, pediatrics because it's just easier for the children to pronounce. My background is in pediatrics, genetics, as well as biochemical genetics. I did my training at Hopkins as well as the NIH, where I did a lot of research in the lysosomal storage disease world. In fact, Gaucher, uh, Gaucher disease is my baby. So I feel very passionately about it. Went on to work at the Rare Disease Institute at um, the RDI at, in Washington, D.C., and then turns out, as much as I loved my patients, I loved clinic, the one thing that was really frustrating was the lack of clinical trials, the difficulty in doing clinical trials. And um, that led to me joining my previous boss in starting a rare disease clinical trial center. We're new, we started in March, but we're all about the clinical trials and hence my talk. So before we talk about clinical trials, let's talk a little bit about the burden and impact of rare diseases. So we've been talking about this the whole day. About 7,000 rare diseases have been identified. The numbers are increasing on a daily basis because of the technology that we have. However, the burden is rather significant and it just doesn't affect the individual. We've heard it affects families, healthcare systems, and societies as a whole, not just in the United States, but globally. So, you know, there are diagnostic delays. This we know because getting to see a geneticist getting to see the right doctor, you know, whether you have insurance, whether you can even see the doctor. So that's something that people have to contend with, limited treatment options. So we know that it's only symptomatic. There are a few, I say curative, but they're not. For instance, SMA, we have gene therapy, but mainly things are now just symptom symptomatic management. Huge financial burden on the families as well on the healthcare system. Psychosocial impact, we've talked about that. The caregiver strain, now this is a huge one because they can barely even look after their child, let alone themselves because of the complexity of a rare disease. And research challenges, this is one of the big things because we have insufficient data due to a small population of patients. Funding for research, getting a grant is extremely tedious. It requires a PhD in itself to fill out forms, you know, hampering the understanding, the underlying mechanisms, and then treatment development in itself. And then one of the big things that we often forget is parents have to take time off. Children have to take time off to, you know, go to these doctor's appointments to go for their treatment. And therefore, you know, they can't work, extended leave, and therefore there is less productivity in the workforce. So why is rare disease clinical trials important and why does it matter? We need to start unlocking treatment options. You know, symptomatic management is just not acceptable anymore. We're diagnosing more patients on a daily basis. We need better treatments. We need to expand medical knowledge, you know, that's what we should be doing. And we also need to take a patient-centric approach. So it's direct collaborations with families, patients, trying to ensure whether the trials actually meet their needs and whether it can lead to improved outcomes. Global collaboration, and that's what this summit is all about. You know, the international collaboration and cooperation, the exchange of data, which is extremely difficult, as well as resource access. Fostering innovation, so we've got to work together to do more research together, to pioneer medical breakthroughs, and then for economic, uh, economic and social benefits, so to reduce overall in, uh, economic burden on healthcare systems. Another reason why clinical trials are important. You get a treatment, patients benefit, they become contributing members to society, less a burden on the medical healthcare system, individuals, and then you know people are more productive. And then regulatory incentives, so FDA, EMA, they need to start working with us right now to see that how can they accelerate the development and the approval of rare disease therapies. So just a bit of statistics, right? It takes a rare disease drug. It takes about 15 years, 12 to 15 years for a rare disease drug to come to market. And that's not acceptable because it's long and it's really expensive. In fact, one of the um, medications that got approved for a drug for a disease called phenylketoyuria it cost them a billion dollars to bring the drug to market. One billion dollars because of FDA regulations and you know um, red tape and the difficulty in getting patients. So this shows us that not only are we utilizing too much money, this needs to be made simpler as well. So takes me to the key challenges. We've touched on some of them already. It's a limited patient population, you know, so... If you want to do a study design that's meant that we typically use for common diseases like diabetes, hypertension, those 
designs are not going to work for this population because sometimes there might only be one patient, you know, and, and of one studies, right? The lack of natural history data. Now, the NIH does a wonderful job with natural history data. A lot of academic centers are doing a wonderful job. The problem is everyone keeps their own data. Nobody wants to share data because data is money. Data means papers. And this is where we should do better and we need to do better, right? Because with good natural history data, you can actually design a wonderful protocol and you can actually interpret the results better. Patient recruitment and retention. So this is a difficult one because regulators often demand very complex protocols. Patients get sick. They can't travel every two weeks for a blood draw. So we need to be decentralized clinical trials. We need to be able to utilize technology, Zoom, phone, you know, telehealth. So that's where we need to change things, right? Ethical issues. So this is a difficult one because everyone wants to make sure that they are doing something ethical. You know, we, we, don't, we don't do something unethical. However, the problem is if there is only one patient in the world with a disease or five patients, sometimes you need to figure out how you can benefit that patient, you know, by thinking outside the box. So this is where we need to work together. And of course, resource limitations, funding is, exp funding, you know, parents who are trying to set up funds. I mean, you've got wonderful people here trying to get money for disorders and funding is a big issue as well. And then there's the expertise and the experience. And one of the issues with rare disease is the geneticists in the United States. I speak for them. There are only about 700 of us. Our waiting list is up to a year, a year and a half long. In West Virginia, you have one geneticist, just one, you know, a biochemical geneticist as well. So if they don't have time for their patients, how are they going to use their expertise to run a rare disease clinical trial, right? And we talked about regulatory barriers. And then we talked about data collection and analysis that can be difficult as well sometimes. And geographic, uh, geographic dispersions. So clinical trial centers sometimes are not convenient for patients to go to. Cost and sustainability. And then safety and monitoring. So safety and monitoring is another key issue because we don't understand the natural history really well sometimes. So when it comes to safety and monitoring of the, of the disease, we falter and then that gets a study suspended and that leads on to further problems. And then long-term follow-ups, you know, getting patients to commit to following up for 10 years because of a drug that's investigational is a long time. It's a lot of time from their lives. So, you know, that's one of the things that can complicate us doing a clinical trial successfully. Um, so, you know, we talked about uh, data sharing initiatives. We have the wonderful RDCRN that's trying to regulate or trying to help with data sharing. And we also need expanded funding from uh, government and philanthropic organizations to help make rare disease research more feasible. And genomic advances. So we have amazing people here working on technology, trying to diagnose patients, hopefully trying to limit the diagnostic odyssey. You know, it takes a long time for them. And that in itself can aid us doing clinical trials successfully. And uh, we talked about all this as well, right, indirectly. So how do we bridge the gap across borders? Establishing international collaborative networks, like what we're doing, using digital technologies, harmonizing regulate, uh, regulatory approvals. So we need to start working as a group, talking to the FDA and EMA and saying that, you know what, we can't sit on our laurels anymore. We need to start working together, trying to make things less restrictive so we can get drugs out earlier. Standardized protocols and data collection, develop global patient registries. The, I am partial to Gaucher disease because I've always worked with them. They have a wonderful global registry. They work with people around the world. But, you know, there are others out there that we need to work with. Data sharing platforms that are unified, that we can use globally. Collaborate with rare disease organizations and the advocates. Funding collaborations. Um, and as I said, you know, patient-centered approaches, regulatory advocacy. And I think the most important one is sharing best practices. I think we can't live, you know, no man is an island. We have to work together to share what we know with others and not live in fear of, you know, our papers getting scoped by other academic, you know, by other people in the academic world, so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, that in itself, in a nutshell, is to why rare disease clinical trials are important, as well as to why, you know, we should do better to make sure that we can help our patients as well.